What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're going to be going over randomness in our game, so we can include random characters and random stages by pressing a button on the menu. I'm also going to be adding little borders to the character and stage select screens, as well as this blue background that you see. It's not really important that you do those necessarily, obviously they're just for aesthetics, but I will cover how I did them. They're quite easy, so it should only take a minute or two once we get there, but we're going to start with the random stuff. So I've added this box at the bottom, where all my lock characters were. The bottom, or the middle of the bottom row is now a question mark. And the question mark is random. Now, I can confirm this, and as of now, it doesn't actually spawn anything on the screen. You probably should put a question mark down or some silhouette or something. And we'll update that in the future. But again, that's just really another graphics change, so it's not the end of the world. And now, I've selected random as my characters. So now I can come over here to my stage select and also select random, which does the same thing, where whatever stage we were on last is what's still displaying on the screen, but now I've selected a random stage to be spawned into. And you can see we've spawned a mutant and a vanguard, and on this stage. Now the vanguard has some initial AI with literally no animations, except for uh, his entrance animation so that we don't get stuck, and I added an anim notified to it. So ignore what you're seeing him do, but you can see that the stage and the characters were random and functioning properly. Now I do have the mannequin disabled from random, just because the mannequin uh, does not have an entrance animation or anything in his blueprint graph that he needs for a proper fight. But you can do this with however many characters you want, and it shouldn't have any issues as long as you've got everything you need for that character, which can always be updated later, I've just temporarily disabled the mannequin so that I didn't have those issues when we're playing the game today. The logic is quite simple, so this will be one of the easier episodes, but I do think it's important to cover random. First of all, random is one of my favorite mechanics. I love picking random and just surprising people with what you get or having to win a match, especially a competitive match, with not knowing what the matchup is going to be. It's a cool, cool feature. So let's get into it. In We're going to need our character select screen and our level select screen. We shouldn't need any code today. We'll just need our widgets up here. This is going to be, again, a pretty simple episode. It's going to be blueprint oriented. And it's not going to be a ton of logic. We just kind of have to think about the way random works. And I'll give you some pointers for how you can customize the screen to work the way you want it. Where we have the level select, the continue to level select, and the continue button. So whether we press like start on a controller, or in my case, enter on the keyboard, or if we press the continue button with the mouse that's on the screen, we are normally going ahead and opening up the stage selection screen, and then setting our characters values, so the, the characters that our players have picked, based off of what their selections were on the character selection screen. That's good. So at this point, we can go ahead and call our choose random character function. Now, if you want to have it to where you press random and the character pops up on the screen, you don't want to wait to this point for that to happen. You actually want to call choose random character during your confirm selection function. This will make it whenever you confirm that you're pressing random, you can change your character. Now, the other important thing is, in here, we have logic to not allow the character to spam the same, or the player to spam the same character over and over again. They have to pick different selections. That's really not important. It's just a preference and a, and a choice that I made. You can feel free to remove it if you want them to be able to spam, uh, spam random and just keep changing their character over and over again. It's literally just this if statement right here. You can remove these nodes. Everything else in this function should stay, and that'll fix that issue and then you'll be able to see your character when you confirm them. The only thing you should do here uh, is uh, when you, this selection value that comes in, this selection is the value that we're setting to confirmed P1 selection. We should check if this selection value is where our random button is, and then assign a proper random value to our confirmed P1 and confirmed P2 selection. You'll see how that works in a second because we have to do that anyway but we need to put that in here. Okay, so if you're doing it this way, 
just go ahead and call choose random character on the correct selection. The way this works is all of our buttons are essentially, they have a selection tied to them. So we have indices and I'm just going from left to right, top to bottom, right? So this isn't too bad. This is index zero, index one, index two. And this is just in theory. They don't actually have to be these. But when we confirm the selection, an integer gets confirmed on this value and the integer is 0, 1, and 2. So we're actually looking for 7 here. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. You can see the question mark is on 7. So as long as this lines up with your uh, designer view of your widget, then you just grab the appropriate value and call choose random character. So if we are on 7, if seven was the confirmed P1 selection when we're going to the stage selection screen, we need to choose a random character. Now, this is the function that I said make earlier. Choose random character essentially just takes in a player index and a game instance reference. I just use the game instance reference because we already had one right outside of the function and I figured it's not worth it to go and make another cast and do extra logic we don't need in your function, if you click on the little function node here with the name of it, you can go over to your inputs section and add two inputs. I'm gonna add an integer in our base game instance reference. So the way you get the base game instance reference is to click on the type and instead of look, using one of these types that's here, just type in the type you're trying to get. The reason we're using base game instance, if you're not familiar with the series, is because in base game instance we have something called p1 character class and p2 character class we really just do that so we can bring these variables and their choices between the scenes there are other ways to do it but any way that you can get your character choices or your players choice of their character to the in-game level that's what you're going to need here we're using our base game instance so i have the reference for that i've called it game instance reference and then the integer is the player index i like to use this method it basically just separates player one and player two using an integer zero or one and we can hard code it because we know who we want to perform the logic on at that time so in this case when we're going to the stage selection screen both player one and player two have their character set at this point so i can simply input player index zero or player index one here and know that the logic is being performed on the correct player And then the game instance was, again, already here from before. It's how we were setting the character classes. So you can just drag this into your game instance reference. For player two, do the same thing. And then let's go over what's inside the function. So the logic is quite simple here. I'm checking the player index to see if it's equal to zero or not. If it's this, again, this determines our character. So player index of zero is player one. A player index of one is player two. So if player index is equal to zero, then we know we want to perform the logic on player one. If it's not equal to zero, or you could go as far as to check if it's equal to one, then we want to perform the logic on player two. So we do a branch. If it's equal to zero, we are player one. If it's false, then we're player two. Otherwise, the logic is the same from here on out. We're just changing the variables that we're setting. We need to grab a node called a random integer. Right click, random integer, and it gives you a max value. Now the max is pretty much what you'd expect it to be. It's the number of options you have. Now it does start at zero, so if you have a max of three like I have here, then you have zero, one, and two. But it gives you that many options. So if I said 100, I have 100 options, but I have zero through 99 as values that will be returned. I'm putting in the number of characters that I have, and you can see that I I have three characters, Mannequin, Mutant, and Vanguard, but I'm only using two at the moment, so the Mutant actually has a much greater chance of being spawned right now. But that will be fixed when the Mannequin is functioning properly, so no worries there. And all you gotta do is drag off of the return value of this random integer, do switch on int, and then set your correct character class values from your game instance reference. Drag off of this and you should be able to do set P1 or set P2 character class. You can also go ahead and set the skin index if you want. So if you want to change a character's outfit, their materials, their color schemes, whatever, you can do that using random as well. It's up to you. I did not do that here.
And then the default here just basically means if this random integer returns a value that's not on the switch statement, it'll automatically go here. It really should never happen as long as you have the correct value. Like in this case, this should only ever return zero through two and we have all those covered. If somehow it returns something greater, then default will fire and it will go to mutant anyway. So it is a good safeguard. I do the same thing for player two. Literally the exact same thing. Just make sure you're setting P2 character class here instead of P1 character class. All right, and that's pretty simple. That's actually all you need to do to actually perform random. It is important that I go back and mention this. So in the confirm selection, if you want to have your characters pop up on the screen, and I'll, I'll give another example real quick. So say this is the mutant, okay, that's his animation. Now, when I confirm random, if I want the character to pop up, so pretend after I hit random, the mutant popped up and did his animation. If I wanna be able to do that and keep randomizing it every time I press it, then I wanna be able to do that on the confirm selection function. So your selection that's here in the uh, input parameter list for your confirm selection function. You should check it to see if the selection is the random selection. So in our case, seven. And then uh, go ahead and call the choose random character function if it is. Then spawn the correct CS actor if it is. We are now spawning our CS actor on move selection. So what you would need to do on move selection is make sure that your your selection is not seven, you're not on random. That way it does not update to um, some random character or have, a, have some sort of uh, placeholder art for the random character and make sure that gets set on random. And then when you confirm, actually uh, replace it with the character that the game chose using random. And that's how you can do that. We can always cover that. We may actually implement that in the future. It'll probably be, again, just one of those quick aesthetic changes where I go over the changes, but I don't go super in depth or make it its own episode just because, you know, there's so many things in game dev that they can be easy, they can be hard, but at the end of the day, you know, once you learn it, you, you'll have to mess with it to make it the way you want it for your game. Anyway... The logic at this point is done for the character select screen. The only thing we need now is the level select screen or the stage selection screen, which isn't much different. In fact, it's not really different at all. I have a choose random stage function that I've made in my level select screen widget. So just add a new function, go into it. And you can see the logic here is actually even simpler because you know each character is gonna be on one stage so it's not like you need two different stages for two different characters. You know, if you had 20 characters, they'd all be on this one stage. So we just need to do this operation one time. Basically, once we have pressed the continue button or again, hit the confirm button, which I'm calling start match here, but this is if you press start on a controller or enter on your keyboard, or if you click the confirm button with your mouse, then we open the level normally. And that's good. We don't have level streaming at the moment, so this is the best way we can do it. But if we click and our confirmed P1 selection is on index seven, index seven again is the random value. We can call our choose random stage function. And our choose random stage function will go ahead and just open the corresponding level. You can just do random integer again. I put in four because I have zero through three and the return value goes into a switch and loads the corresponding level. So there you go. Now you can have random characters and random stages. You can spice it up multiple ways by either allowing the random to be shown uh, during the character select or only when you get in the game. Also, if you want to show the level once you've chosen it as random, what you could do before loading the level is actually go ahead and switch the, let me show you. So you could actually go ahead and switch the preview in the background here as we're doing it with the, you know, the movies or the render targets. You can go ahead and switch that when the random selection is chosen in this function and then open the level. 
That should cover if you want to see your characters and your stages before the game loads, choosing random, and if you don't. Okay, and now I'm just going to go over a few things very quickly to show you how I got my character select screen background in. The image may change, but I just wanted to have something so that I didn't have the default Unreal background. You can see there's still some lighting things going on because the background itself, the render target that it's being displayed to, or excuse me, the plane it's being displayed to through the render target does not have shadows applied to it, but the characters do, the actors do. So you can see that, you know, the lighting could definitely be adjusted. But all I've done is used a render target that captures the image of a plane with the actors in front of it. So quite frankly, if I am to look at my world outliner and find I have a plane out in the middle of nowhere like this, just above my stages where I have my other levels, and I have a regular plane, not even my plane blueprint, just a regular plane I brought into the screen, changed the material to the background I wanted to get a background out of a picture or texture all you have to do is go to the picture you want right click on it and create material and that's what I've done and then I've applied the material to the plane and then this is a scene capture 2d I'm not going to go into uh, how this works because we covered this in depth in the stage selection tutorials so if you want to see them I'll leave a link in the iCard right here but I'm using the same method here and I've also tagged this scene component as CS capture for character select capture. So then in my character selection screen, I do the same logic again that we do in the stage selection screen for the render targets, but I'll go ahead and show you anyway really quickly. I basically get all uh, scene components, my default scene 2D captures, and then I grab the capturing component, check the tags, see if it's equal to CS capture. If it is, that's the only time we continue. And then we're gonna go ahead and set to be hidden in game and set the visibility. It's important to note I am doing this on construct so you can see if I were to go to the state selection screen and come back this would still be marked as invisible so you'll need to set these to be visible again when you're out of the state selection screen when you back out but basically I'm saying yes display this render target and then once this loop is done and we have set the render target and the plane to be visible I get all actors of class for the plane blueprint I go and I get my static mesh of the plane blueprint grab the component tags and check for image so image is one i've got over here let me see if this is the correct one or not it's this one right here you can't see it because it's currently invisible but i have a plane in front of my camera where my actor spawn to display background images too to give a 3d ui effect and again it's normally invisible by default but what i do is i make it visible as long as it's not that plane, I set the visibility to be true because that's the image one. We actually want the render target one. Again, this will make sense if you watch the other episode, but the image is just a static image we can place. The render target is one that comes from the camera, which is coming from the camera because it's right up there. And if we want an animated background, it is good to use either a render target or an actual movie file that you put in your UI. And then after that, I begin the rest of construct. So the only other thing I need to add is if we're returning from the level select back to the character select, then we need to make sure we set this CS capture back to visible as well as the plane back to visible. And lastly, I wanted to go over just these little borders I added. They can make all the difference when you look in the character select screen and say selection screen. Them having these borders makes, makes them look a lot better than just free floating. And it's very simple how I did it. I went into PowerPoint and I made a box with a transparent fill. That way I have an object that can be used as a border. Now in my widget hierarchy here, I've gone ahead and actually copied my character selection box and my, uh, you know, both my character selection boxes. I actually copied them and pasted them back into the canvas panel they were in. I removed the image that they were using. So like this one is using the mannequin profile picture. I actually removed it and made it, replaced it with my border image, which is that black box. So the reason I copied it is they're in the exact same place now. Copied and pasted and now it's right over top of it, but I have the border image. All I do is I set my draw as 
thing here, <laughs> draw as property in the appearance to box. And box will go around uh, wherever I have that image. See, the image is just as big as the mannequin image. They're literally the same size in the same position. So I'm just putting a box around it. And since I've kept everything the same size, everything's 200 by 200, and these are also 200 by 200, then all I have to do is apply that to each image and I can freely change out the character images without changing out the border, since they should be independent in my opinion. All right guys, I think that's about it as far as this episode goes, so thank you so much for watching. If it helped you, please subscribe. It does more for the channel than anything else you can do, and I can just, I just really appreciate it. it. Let's me know I'm doing a good job, and I'm excited for where this series can go. We're gonna start getting into multiple hitboxes, as well as some other commands such as dashing, back dashing, and forward dashing in the near future, so get ready for those. I wanna give a huge shout out to my YouTube membership and Patreon sub uh, subscribers and supporters. I really do appreciate the extra and additional support you've given me on top of just the love you've given to the channel. So thank you very much. I'm very excited for where we can take the series and what we can do with this channel in the future. If you had any issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials, feel free to join the Discord community. There's a link in the description. You can go ahead and click it. You'll join the community, and then we'll be able to help you with any of the problems you had. Lastly, guys, if you want to see live programming streams or just come hang out while I play some Dark Souls, we do do live streams every Wednesday and Friday, 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, depending on how I feel. And... I do upload them to this YouTube channel, I'll put an iCard right here, show on the road 27, where you can see all the streams I've ever done, including the live streams. But I alternate between doing a programming live stream on Twitch and a programming live stream right here on this channel. So look out for either of those if you're interested. And I'll see you in the next one, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you later.